Hello, my name is Friedemann Pulvermüller, and this talk is on constraining networks biologically to explain grounding. Thanks for your interest. Um, the topics today would be to speak first about grounding, introducing the concept um, and the background, then going into evidence for grounding, arguing why it's absolutely necessary. And uh, I would uh, like I would like to argue then that it's actually a good idea to develop biologically constrained models of grounding mechanisms. I would then go on to discuss four examples where I believe that such a model could help uh, to answer questions which are long-standing and perhaps of general interest. I would then finally um, touch a few issues about future research needs. The dominating view on semantics and concept, concepts has once been uh, the following. Concepts relate to each other to different degrees. So each concept is uh, can be explained by other concepts that relate to this concept to different degrees and depending on the relation between two, any two concepts a line could be drawn which is either very short in case of a very tight relationship or longer for a more loosely uh, organized relationship. A different way of approaching uh, the, 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 the uh, conceptual um, representation issue to to explain each concept in terms of features and feature values so that a given concept would, uh, would be characterized by a range of, sh of features, feature value pairs. So this approach has of course limitations and the limitations has been the major limitation has been put forward uh, most clearly in and earliest by John Searle in his comments on uh, the so-called Chinese room argument, where he just argues very generally that relating symbols to other symbols cannot explain meaning or concepts. So this can be phrased in very different ways and also Searle touched upon many issues in his famous papers and in his book. Um, but the major point would be that, uh, that if I say that the, the, that the word fire engine relates to fire and to, and to a house and to catastrophe and so on, then I would explain words by words and this only works if I, in the first place, understand uh, some of these words at the very least. Uh, this argument has also been made uh, very concisely and in a very clear format um, by Stephen Harnett. And uh, let, let me just uh, uh, explain the problem in a slightly different way. Uh, we can, of course, connect a sign with its concept or meaning, but then something is missing, namely the relationship of these uh, of these two to something else, to something in the world, as we may want to say. So the symbol and the objects and actions the, enti the, the symbol is used to speak about needs to be clarified. So you may say that there is a relationship to objects in the world but, and that this is not peri peripheral to the concept or to meaning is the major argument. It's a semantic task to specify this relationship too. And indeed, most semantic theories would actually make this claim that meaning has different components. And of course, the sign would be would need to be related to the objects and uh, it can be used to speak about. And, and the concept uh, kind of uh, occupies a mid, uh, an intermediate role, a bridging role between the two. Um, Yes, 
the important thing is there are some colleagues uh, uh, favoring the the, uh, the symbolic meaning uh, approach uh, that are who argue that actually these reference uh, that reference these objects in the world are not re uh, intrinsically related to meaning that it's kind of only peripheral to meaning but on the other hand we need to take into account that these that these objects can be used as a criteria for understanding the meaning uh, of a word. For example, we do this in psycholinguistics when we uh, use a word to picture matching tasks where our subjects have to show the, that they know the meaning uh, by finding the right pictures for the objects and so on. So it's not so that the object relationship is just per, uh, peripheral to meaning. Right. Uh, now, how could one mechanistically uh, conceive or describe the link between the sign and the referent? And uh, famously, Stephen Hornet has proposed here that something like a neural network could be could be built in between the two and this has been uh, realized in various ways since and works pretty well and it's uh, of course a nice thing to have a model a mechanistic model of how meaning might work uh, this is uh, in in Stevens hand hands uh, a hybrid model was proposed whereby he, some of the words would actually link directly to reference through features uh, that, that that might emerge here in the in the network somehow. Although this is usually not uh, not the target of research, these mechanisms then going on within the so-called hidden layers of these networks. Um, but then there is also a second. Um, step in meaning production which can be used for example to build meanings uh, uh, of of uh, terms that have not been grounded uh, in object and action knowledge uh, just by putting together some of the words whose world relationship is already known to a degree so the important thing is here so we can explain if we know what horse and stripes mean from experience, we can then explain that a zebra connects the two somehow. This uh, grounding problem solution uh, might be considered to be a final solution, and I said it has been very popular to. Uh, to produce models of this sort. However, one may ask for additional evidence that the, that, the, that grounding works in this way and meaning processing depends on such grounding um, from experimental research. And one may also um, question whether this kind of model with the three layers or maybe a more recent form of a model with uh, which is a little bit deeper than typically uh, would be already a satisfying solution or whether we could uh, uh, increase the demand on the neural re realism of the of the network and the explanation and then, of course, we may say that uh, that from a semantic perspective, uh, words like cat and dog uh, and and fish might not be the the only semantic types. There are other words like internal state words, abstract entities, actions, uh, which are not covered by this object link. So one may, well, may one may propose that uh, we, we could put together a distributed model of the aforementioned type and a symbolic model to produce a hybrid model with 
with different parts, with symbolic parts and distributed and, and neural parts. On the other hand, one could think about whether there might be possibilities to produce an integrative, integrative model of, uh, of neural networks that would actually carry cognitive and symbolic functions. And we have been trying to develop one uh, a type of model that produces groups of cells that may possibly carry symbolic meaning and symbolic information. And then one may, uh, one may, one may ask whether such models, uh, independent of which type, are biologically plausible, uh, might might be a, a satisfying implementation of grounding and uh, would be extendable to account for other things like abstract concepts, as I said, and syntax. How could such a model look in principle just by theorizing of what's going on in the brain? Maybe there could be some clues. Uh, in uh, in the context of a neurobiological model of language, we would probably assume that um, that um, uh, word forms and linguistic entities more generally are represented somehow in the language regions of the human brain here in perisylvian cortex. Um, when we, however, learn that and a word such as the word sun relates to objects in the world, then we may not only see activation in the brain in these language regions, so to speak, but also in sensory systems, for example, especially in this case in the visual system, so that we have activation also here in the back of the brain, in the visual cortex, in the inferior temporal cortex, where uh, where um what information is is of course uh, stored and if those neuron populations if you conceive those little dots here as neurons or neuron small neuron groups uh, then uh, then these, acti these activate together and according to Hebbian learning they should link together also what fires together wires together so and so we might expect to end up with a cell assembly that uh, that spans the language and the visual areas with some neurons there included. Uh, so this would be such a group of cells strongly connected and then possibly carrying the the, the concept together with, with its related word. And interestingly here, one might speculate whether perhaps uh, the individual neurons or neuron groups could be candidate um, implementations of the semantic features postulated by some semantic theory. Um, how would this go? Uh, let, let, me just, let me just be more explicit and go in a little bit more detail. Um, here uh, you, we see again the perisylvian group of, uh, of, of neurons related to the processing of the word form. Um, here would be some visual perceptual neurons and at the different levels of the visual stream uh, here at the back, here in the middle in the middle of the temporal lobe and at the, uh, at the, in the anterior part of the, of the temporal lobe, we know that individual neurons respond to very different features of the uh, of the visual input. For example, very simple features such as uh, such as a, a, a round thing of one color on the background of uh, of a different color, or then a, a, a kind of an arrangement of features like something round together with uh, with, a, with with something of a line shape. Which could be could uh, capture some of the fe features of a of a of a real eye stimulus, and then at, at very anterior temporal air, uh, areas we have uh, very complex cells that uh, that would respond to very complex arrangements of visual features, and those could actually be bound together. And a first approach would be 
files together, wires together, so the whole object representation would be bound together with a linguistic representation. However, this is not necessarily correct, and actually it has been criticized that, that um, a concept is not just the addition of the many objects that fall under the concept, but one could actually argue that in the process of this learning, of the learning that a, wor that a word relates to very different uh, perceptual uh, objects, uh, one one could something like an em could see something like an emergent emergence of semantic features. How would that work? Well, think of uh, of now a person seeing very different eyes in the in the uh, while at the same time hearing the word I in each case. Um, in this case, there will be feature neurons for each of the of the individual eyes that are only active with one eye. For example, here the color features would uh, would be not common to the three eyes, and therefore and therefore would only activate in one of the to one of the instances of the of the concepts. However, there are other features such as those indicated here on the left side, like this figure ground. Uh, general shape uh, shape features like like a, a, the 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 line with a with a with a with a circle in the middle is a feature that could be could be seen as shared between the different instances and uh, and therefore some of these perceptual neurons will activate in if not in all the cases of perceiving an instance instance of the concept then uh, at least in uh, in some of them in a, in a uh, significant number of cases therefore they would activate in good correlation with the word form assuming that the word form is spoken a few times when the when the when the objects are present and uh, and therefore they should bind most strongly to the word form representation. So actually what we would expect is actually that the semantic representation would not be the sum of all the instances about you know, the features of the instances but that we would actually uh, distill out a set of features which are not only perceptual and referent related but that are indeed semantic and so far that they are typical for the for a range of different objects falling under the concept so and the important point would he would, uh, would here be that semantic feature extraction could be uh, could be a function of this pairing of world and word uh, information and correlation learning would be an in, uh, would be the mechanism for it hebbian correlation learning not just adding up a long list of reference uh, as a as a as an instantiation of the con right uh, of course it's also important to ask how indirect semantic grounding in the world might be possible it was again Stephen who, who pointed to the fact that we need to have a possibility of indirect grounding think of the zebra example so uh, something like a parasitic or a, or, or a, a, a theft of semantic features uh, should be possible after learning one particular um, uh, word in the grounding situation, a, a new word form, a pseudo word, could be paired with a previously with with a previously learned uh, word form that carries meaning, and by that um, one one could assume that some of the semantic features uh, of the of, of the already known item and the the phonological features of the uh, of the new a pseudo word would actually link together. Why? Because we also assume in this type of uh, cell assembly model that there is a that there is competition. Here, for example, in the Peri-Sylvian space, uh, if I hear word number one, 
and then word form number two there, uh, this word form number two would kind of compete with a perisylvian activation here there would be some inhibition you do there's regulation in the system so this uh, this activation here would be tuned down so that the perisylvian uh, network of word number two becomes active while still some of the semantic neurons of the of the first item may be active why because there is no inhibition in the in the, in the temporal in the, in the temporal part of the um, uh, of the cortex so therefore we would ex uh, expect that such a such a um, parasitic or indirect semantic grounding is possible and we have actually some evidence also that in the model this works let's now look at a linguistic um, limitation of the current approach not all words relate to objects not every symbol is about the world in the sense that that there's one concept and one object in the world that relate to it there are other there, there are other types of symbols and, the, and a, a more general way of approaching the uh, the issue of meaning is to say to to adopt Wittgenstein's idea that actually the use of a symbol of a word in language is related to its meaning or explains its meaning um, if we uh, take this seriously obviously the, the game of uh, of naming an object and uh, the relationship between an object and the word is only one type we might be interested in uh, there there are also action related words that that relate to not, not to a part of the body but to an action performed with this part of the body or uh, or then there are abstract concepts and internal state concepts like like uh, happiness which are not really related to objects we need different uh, approaches to their meaning and also uh, one famous um, uh, remark Wittgenstein made is that the, this idea of shared semantic features is not always correct for concepts no so a concept is not always the set of shared semantic features often uh, of all the instances of the concept sometimes there is a relationship of family resemblance where the different where the different instances of the concepts do not have anything in common we have to take this into account right um, so but the most important issue is we need to take care of other concepts too not not object related ones and and interest and of course evidently an action relationship of a concept needs to be captured too and now let's think about a simple case uh, the learning of the word run of course in this case uh, there would not be a particular visual perception that lies at the heart of the of, of the referential semantic uh, learning and grounding in the world there would be uh, there would be a relationship between a body action and uh, and therefore active uh, activation patterns not in the visual part of the cortex but in the motor and a prefrontal uh, cortices and therefore the networks the circuits there of neurons that build up in the brain might also look a little bit different and also the semantic features may include features of actions as shown here on the right in red um, so we get to a kind of uh, very um, widespread uh, uh, model of uh, of semantics or a distributed model where, where um, apart from the perisylvian language network uh, there, there would also be grounding information stored in temporal circuits and an action related semantic information grounded in uh, in in motor sensory motor systems in dorsal uh, cortex uh, 
and this is of course incomplete still we we do not have the parietal cortex of course they are they are word types that also relate and are grounded in 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 in, uh, in uh, relational information uh, in, for example, prepositions where, where this part of the brain comes into play, and then now there are words uh, referring to uh, to odors, for example, where the where the odor systems of the brain uh, come in, and the tactile uh, words and sound words, and so on. So, so depending on the different modalities through which um, information is channeled during grounding of semantic. Uh, to, during grounded semantic learning, uh, different brain parts may be may come into play for specific linguistic types. This is this approach is very different from the traditional approach. Even though the pictures look uh, admittedly very similar, the important part is that in a in a traditional modular view, we would assume that there is a separate speech production network, a separate speech perception network, a, se a separate visual processing network, and a, sp and a specific uh, and, a, and, uh, and a specific um, motor network, and that that um, the networks for semantics and for concepts are even different from those. For example, uh, as we uh, as you may know, and as, as, as we will discuss later, the, the, the idea, there's an idea that here in the temporal pole or in anterior temporal cortex, there is a center for meaning processing and others have argued that maybe it's not there, but rather here in temporal cortex or uh, a, fur a further proposal is that, that we have semantics here uh, and concepts here in frontal cortex. So the, the idea is here again on the left is modular. There are different networks and each area is dedicated to one uh, particular function. But on the right, we have kind of an integrate, integrative, sorry, um, approach where we uh, where we would assume that that the interplay between these perisylvian and extra perisylvian networks would result would uh, would produce uh, 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 semantics semantic symbol processing um, as an epiphenomenon as an epiphenomenon as a as a uh, as an as, as a emergent function if you wish there's some neuroscience evidence that this uh, this grounding idea in different modal systems of the brain is not entirely incorrect um, for example here when we when we process words that relate to actions performed with a, with the legs or with a hand or with a with a mouth we see brain activation patterns that are quite similar to um, and sometimes overlapping uh, with the with the activation patterns seen during actual body movements, and the, and, the, and then in um, in 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 the processing of words related to different visual entities or visual features such as form and uh, and color, we see different parts of the temporal cortex being activated. Um, here in blue versus uh, red for 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 uh, for, for uh, color words and for uh, for form words and likewise sound words, odor words, taste taste words, touch words. They each activate separate modality specific systems in the brain, thus thus providing some evidence for grounding at the neurobiological level. I will not go into this uh, in great detail, but feel free to ask later and we discuss it uh, on demand. Um, this may all be very plausible and you may be convinced and I would be very happy about that. Um, and I thought so also uh, already 20 years ago, a little bit more, when I published a little paper under Stephen Harnard's guidance in the behavioral and brain sciences, um, where um, the, the, this theoretical proposal was put forward 
is about set assemblies and distributed networks of different types. However, since there, there has been some criticism of this uh, modeling idea, and especially when uh, one criticism is, of course, we don't, uh, this seems plausible, but it's not very precise. Uh, it's not very, uh, it's, it's it not, it doesn't show us that it has to be like this. Um, and by using a mathematically precise model, um, the, one might improve on uh, on the theorizing um, side. Also, this model should perhaps not be just neural in the sense that it has some vague similarity to the to, to brain and to the elements of the brain, like a neural networks that has that consists of kind of neuron nerve cell-like elements, but its structure is very dissimilar to the brain. But actually, what we want is a model of the brain that also resembles the different parts of the brain and ideally, uh, in the end, should mimic the different functions of the different parts of the brain, for example, in semantic grounding and in semantics generally. How could this be done? Well, of course, we would need to constrain our, constrain our neural network. We would need to include some features that make it more similar than an average neural network uh, to the real brain. What constraints could come into play here? Well, um, well, first of all, of course, the structure of the network should resemble that of the real brain. The different areas, for example, of cortex could be implemented, or at, one, at least those that are relevant in the concept and learning, um, uh, learning uh, enterprise. Now, uh, we also would like to mimic not only structure, of the of the of the areas, but also the connectivity of the brain at different levels, at the macro level of fiber tracts between areas and lobes, at the micro level uh, where we would ideally have sparse, random, topographic, and initially weak connections, and uh, and and then we would uh, uh, like to implement both long and local short uh, short uh, distance connectivity. Uh, this is not all. We also want to have the individual neuron should be as like uh, as close as possible to the uh, to the real neurons. However, uh, by implementing all details of a real no uh, neuron, uh, we we would of course burden the computational capacity of any computing device very, very heavily. So, so a compromise needs to be needs to be thought uh, needs to be uh, found between uh, really realistic neurons and uh, moderately um, uh, realistic neurons such as mean field or integrate and fire spiking neurons that, that are reasonably realistic uh, but uh, not computationally too demanding. Then we also would like to implement learning, some kind of a Hebbian biologically realistic uh, learning mechanism. Um, and finally, of course, not finally, as one further point of many points, regulation would need to be implemented so that uh, not too much and not too little activation is present in the brain model at any time. Right, so, so to put this just graphically, so we want to go from the micro level of neurons and their learning mechanisms to the macro level of areas and connections between them. And in between, we also want to uh, put a little bit of emphasis on the, inter the, uh, on the interplay between neurons in the local compartment. We want to uh, we want to do justice to all these levels. We want to have global in, uh, regulation mechanisms. Uh, and, uh, and we want to use such a constrained model now to mimic language, grounding, 
semantic learning um, and, uh, and and we would also like to relate this then somehow to brain activation as we can report, record it in the experiment. Yes, this is one um, example, the first attempt. Um, we tried uh, Max Carignani, uh, did this in his PhD thesis in 2008. He built uh, and uh, around in the 10 years around 10 years ago he built and developed this model uh, where uh, now first focusing on the perisylvian cortex uh, and as you can see this perisylvian cortex can of course be subdivided into into other areas uh, we started here with three areas a motor a premotor a prefrontal and, and a peripheral uh, superior temporal a para belt area, a belt area, and uh, and an auditory cortex, and uh, and those were were connected with each other, and then this network was allowed to learn, learn first of all just word forms. So what is that? We would uh, we would implement in the first place babbling when the little child speaks uh, it activates some neurons in the motor cortex we did this just by activating a random sample of neurons here on the motor side and a corresponding random sample random sample on the auditory side why because when the child babbles it hears itself bubble as the, it hears the sounds and therefore there's correlated activation on both sides of the network if you wish and this uh, correlated activation led, believe it or not, to the formation of a circuit across the network spanning neurons from the auditory to the motor side with actually uh, even larger numbers of neurons here in between. So we built uh, what we observed in the model is the for spontaneous formation of a cell assembly based on an implemented Hebbian learning rule. And this is again the learning uh, mechanism which was implemented, which follows some, uh, some um, uh, insights from neurobiology. Um, what happens here uh, can be illustrated by an activation film, so to speak. For that, uh, we we take this this uh, model and, we, and uh, here is the general area structure. Here we have the different here we have the different areas, and uh, and uh, and they are, and the color indicates the correspondence to the real brain. It's actually from left blue to uh, to red on the right. So actually we should well we should. Um, turn around this brain here at the top but doesn't uh, doesn't want to do it um, and then we activate it here on the auditory side just to have a spreading of activation from left to right here um, so we activate um, uh, in the auditory cortex uh, assuming that we would activate the pattern corresponding to one word form this would come in here in the auditory cortex the F, by activating some uh, the defined set of neurons that uh, that has been used during the learning of the of a particular word form originally babbling syllable babble, uh, syllable babbling was modeled and later on word form learning and uh, the word form would then be presented here to the network here on the left and then would be allowed to spread throughout the network. Here the different columns represent the different areas and from top to bottom uh, it's time that increases and time continues then here on the right and as you can see uh, there's activation here coming up first in the auditory cortex. From there, it spreads to the to the middle of the network, and uh, and then we have at at one stage kind of an an explosion like um, process in the middle here. Uh, you see that activation spreads throughout the network from left to right, um, and then finally the third stage of the activation. Uh, activation would slowly uh, would persist, but in the end slowly die out towards the towards 
increasing time. We can separate these three phases and name them as follows. We could say, we can assume that, for, that we can of course say that the first stage is one of stimulation, and then there is this full activation of the of the learned cell assembly, uh, which we call ignition. And after that, activation reverberates in the network and only slowly dies out after some time. So this can be related to reverberation. And reverberation, of course, has a certain resemblance to uh, working memory, wh whereas the ignition process can be identified at the psychological level with a process of, um, of recognition. So I activate the whole cat, so to speak, even if the half of the cat is hidden behind a tree based on a, f uh, on a few features that came in. And, and likewise, I understand the whole word already before it's actually fully uh, spelled out uh, in, in perception. I can word recognition, as we know, can precede um, uh, the, the end of a word and in spoken word recognition and uh, and and we model this in the network by this explosion like ignition process and all this modeling could uh, be seen as evidence for a hebbian idea of uh, cell assemblies whereby different stages of activation uh, could can be distinguished within such a strongly connected network, namely a stage, an initial stage of uh, first activation, and then importantly a stage of ignition and a stage of reverberation. So the memory and the recognition stages. And importantly, in contrast to many other neural networks, this type of network has built something like, in the end, uh, a localist representation of a symbol or a meaning, uh, in, as, we, as we see, as we will see at the, at the moment, this kind of model doesn't, doesn't yet have meaning, but, uh, but we'll come to that in a bit. But the important thing is there's one circumscribed network that actually represent, uh, represents a symbol, which some uh, neural modelers have been denying. So they argue that such symbolic representation are alien to, uh, to connectionist networks. Right. Now we are in a position to address some questions with this kind of network. So can this type of network help us in our understanding of things we haven't possibly understood so far? For example, we know that language is specific to humans. And we know, on the other hand, that also the human cortex is special in the sense that it distinguishes itself from uh, other animals' cortices. Are the two related? The anatomical structure and this function of being able to process language. And one of the hallmarks of, of language processing is uh, at the, already at the level of the lexicon. We have lexic well, we have we can learn as humans many words, many many words, ten thousands of words, and as a prerequisite for that is that we have verbal working memory. We can uh, we can activate uh, we can activate a, a linguistic representation and keep it active for a while. It doesn't fade away right away, but it's uh, but it's but it's being maintained for some time. Now, can we relate the two, the neuroanatomical change and this functional change of, of verbal, of the emergence of verbal working memory and, of, and then the built up of vocabularies? Well, the anatomical difference between monkeys and, and humans is, uh, is illustrated here. 
you see that there are the two areas inferior frontal cortex and then large parts of the temporal of the temporal cortex are strongly connected in humans here um, but only very weakly connected in uh, in in macaques or in chimpanzees um, well we also this is from a different study comparing chimpanzees and humans and again you can see that there's a uh, there, there's a stronger connection here on the uh, from the frontal inferior frontal to the uh, temporal cortex here, here in, the, in the hands of of different uh, different authors this one is by the Catani group sorry for missing the um, the reference at the bottom and from this we discussed different ways of implementing the difference and what uh, one first uh, approach towards modeling the difference looked somewhat like this we changed the connectivity structure between our uh, our, mo our models we built two models a monkey model here on the left and a, and a human model here on the right and the main difference is now not uh, ignoring the sizes of the brain and uh, and sizes of the areas assuming that these are perhaps not so important but rather implementing the connectivity structure which is a qualitatively new feature of the human brain uh, and, and what we what we see here um, is that we uh, that we that we uh, have weaker versus stronger um, frontotemporal connectivity in the two models um, and in one case we just have next neighbor connections between areas this is the uh, this here is a um, display in form of a matrix where the adjacent areas are next to each other and you can see only next neighbors are connected here in the in the green uh, uh, squares uh, but here on the right we have this we have this uh, uh, we have this second row of squares in purple and uh, which shows that there are also this so-called jumping links between non-adjacent areas for example here the motor and the prefrontal areas or importantly premotor and superior temporal cortex here this connection is of particular relevance has been much discussed and um, also this is results of course in the fact that here on the right you know, the path from input to uh, from input to output is a little bit shorter so you need only one two three steps as a minimum uh, from from one end to the other of the network while here you need to make all the five steps path length is longer in the monkey model shorter in the human model well these differences have functional implications and the model the brain constraint model can be used to show this and when we uh, when we are actually Malte Schoenes Henningsen um, performed this simulation uh, he, he could show that in the monkey model activation was uh, well, was coming uh, coming up area by area first the auditory then the next area then the next area you can see the activation of the areas here in the different activation curves and only finally the motor system parts uh, where uh, came came into play after some time and then importantly activation came up and died out immediately again after a short time um, activation was had been gone on the other hand uh, on the as you can see here on the right in the in the human model activation spreading was a bit quicker here we have a we have a rather uh, short delay between initial stimulation and then activation across the whole network um, only the motor cortex here lags behind a little bit um, but uh, but otherwise uh, the, the the other areas come up pretty quickly and, and not in a serial manner as on the left and importantly there's a longer uh, time 
while activation is still being maintained. There, there is, if you wish, activation uh, reverberation or a correlate of working memory. So we have here a tentative explanation based on network structure, based on this, uh, this evolutionary anatomical change from monkey chimpanzee to, to human um, of the specific feature humans didn't show, namely verbal working memory. And uh, we can assume that, uh, that, that as a result of these here, this is a slightly different display, again, uh, showing you the time um, activation was actually maintained within the network and in the different ar areas of the network. Here you can see that activation maintenance, maintenance was kind of okay, but just in two areas of the monkey model. Um, but but uh, in the human model, activation maintenance or or verbal working memory was at least twice as more than twice as uh, as uh, long lasting uh, compared with the monkey model and in the peripheral areas in the motor or auditory cortex there was even a more dramatic difference so essentially we can say that stronger links and jumping links would actually lead to stronger and larger cell assemblies and especially the, uh, at the functional level, we, uh, we obtain reverberation of activation and working memory. And from here, there's a, there's a clear um, pathway to building up a vocabulary and also a larger one as we, can, as, as we do, as we as humans do. And, and our uh, closest evolutionary relatives um, uh, don't, so they lack this important ability. Um, good. So let me move to one more question, or uh, two actually at a time. Why do different word and concept types seem to depend on different parts of the brain? Uh, and we know this phenomenon as that of category specific semantic mechanisms. Why are, and, and then we, we know on the other hand that there are these regions where lesion uh, in, in the brain leads to a general semantic deficits across many uh, conceptual categories. Why is that? Why are, why is there a region far removed from the, from the motor cortex or the auditory cortex or the visual cortex that actually seems to be very essential for concept processing? Um, let me go into the data between, behind this. Uh, here on the left, we, yeah, I, I show you some of our recent data about very small lesions here, for example, in, in, the, in, the, in the motor system um, that led to a problem with tool words. For example, here, uh, Damasio's and uh, Tranel's old uh, study where they showed that small lesion in premotor cortex Broca's region led to a verb processing difference and uh, a problem deficit and here different types of nouns were impaired with different lesions here in the temporal cortex. They report here a category specific deficit but on the other hand uh, there's a big literature on temporal cortex um, role in uh, semantic dementia, if the, if the lesion profile in a dementia looks like this, with both temporal lobes affected, then the patient has a very strong semantic deficit, a semantic dementia. And this has led some of our, uh, of our colleagues to the claim that semantics is actually located in the brain and especially uh, draws on these, on the anterior temporal cortex. This doesn't exclude the possibility that there is also a category specific uh, contribution of other areas. And there are, there's also an attempt to integrate the two approaches with each other on both sides, actually. But, uh, but it's very important to take note that these two phenomena exist, that there is 
something in the brain of a hub type, maybe not only in temporal cortex, but also in frontal and parietal cortex. And that there are also, on the other hand, these category specific uh, regions where a lesion uh, impairs preferentially one uh, category. Actually, the temporal pole may be a mix because there, uh, as, as you saw here, there is also uh, the evidence for category specificity if a lesion happens there. Okay, can we approach this? Can we answer, can we, can we, uh, answer the question why there are semantic hubs and semantic category specific areas with a model? For this, of course, we need to extend the model and finally get to the point where we also will be able to implement semantic grounding, the main fo focus of the talk today. And, uh, and therefore that we need to include a dorsal motor area, set of areas and a ventral uh, temporal uh, visual processing stream at least. And in between, we have the dorsal and ventral language systems included too. And of course, we know that it's uh, there's no question that, uh, that that we have information processing in these in all of these system, systems during language learning. For example, a word form would actually activate uh, the ventral motor cortex, uh, this these reddish areas, uh, when we when we speak. The auditory would uh, auditory cortex would activate when we and and and, and auditory systems would activate when we hear language. The visual cortex would be would be activated in perceiving uh, reference in the dorsal the dorsal lateral motor cortex and premotor cortex prefrontal cortex activate of course in in the processing of the actions uh, action word relates to relate to. So uh, we can all we can impl we need to implement these parts, and we can implement a basic form of language learning and uh, world grounding with this model. We can present the model with a uh, with a, a representation of an of an object in the world, a dog, and also uh, with a representation of a linguistic form, the spoken word dog. We can also, uh, and we can all may, maybe also activate uh, corresponding neurons on the motor side uh, the, uh, to represent the articulation of the word form, which uh, would correspond then to the to the production of the child of the word form, and and in the in the learning of the of a, of a, of an action related word, the the baby would possibly produce an action grasp with a hand, for example, then here the mother say the word grasp or even repeat the word grasp uh, while doing this. So, uh, and, and in the model, we would just apply activation patterns re representing, representing word form here in the bottom part of the network and aspects of the, of the semantics of the um, of the referent information of the word at the bottom of the in the we call this also the perisylvian space of the model and the extrasylvian space of the model. And we could hope that cell assemblies would build up that that are the basis of the grounding of the meaning of these um, uh, of these terms. Uh, and as, we, as you can see here, it's indeed something like a grounding um, uh, process takes place. After a while, after a few instances, hundreds, thousands of learning steps, uh, ideally we can observe that cell assemblies have formed across the entire architecture, across all cell 12 areas in this case and uh, and here at the bottom you see now a representation of single neurons belonging to the neuronal assemblies 
uh, that have been formed as a consequence of semantic semantic grounding learning. Here you have the um, particularly important uh, extra sylvian areas, the visual and anterior temporal and the and the motor and and the motor and prefrontal areas. Um, uh, here from visual to anterior temporal, from from visual to anterior temporal, and from motor to uh, prefrontal. And uh, and as you can see here, we see different dots. Each of the dots mean one neuron in the model, one model neuron that became a part of the representation of one of the words in blue. Uh, is you see here the object and uh, one example object related word in red you see the neurons of the action related word network and uh, yellow uh, are those neurons that happened to be part of both uh, circuits and as you can see here in the perisylvian cortex there's a very dense uh, population of neurons and they and they are and they are um, similar for both word types. So the action words has lots of neurons here in the middle, but also some here on the motor and the motor and the acoustic side. Uh, and, and likewise, the, the so, so the object and the action rela related words they behave very similarly on the, uh, with regard to this. On the other hand, if we move now to the to the extra Sylvian space, we see marked pronounced differences. Here in the motor area, we only see neurons of the action word representation. Here on the visual side, we see primarily neurons of the object word cell assembly. And here in the middle, however, uh, we see we see a good uh, we see a good mix once again with with anterior temporal cortex and prefrontal uh, lateral uh, cortex uh, showing several many neurons of action and um, object related words. So we see different phenomena here. One one is this category specificity feature, which is, which is the direct consequence of the grounding of the meaning of these words in in object knowledge, visual object knowledge, and uh, and motor related action knowledge. And uh, on the other hand, we see a generally pronounced accumulation of the of neurons, so higher neuron densities here in towards the middle of the network. And this is interesting too, but remember we have to explain the, the presence of semantic hubs and what our model does, and it did it for free without being forced to it, and it produced some, uh, some semantic hubs towards the middle of the network. In the central areas, in the in those areas that are, from a connectivity perspective, most central. So those here are the connection hubs um, of the network. Here, most of the information is being trafficked. So here, information transmission is is uh, in the center, and this is most likely why activation. Uh, would accumulate there, and as a result of that, the number of neurons uh, that participate in the semantic representation is highest here. Now, uh, looking again here at the bottom, you see again these uh, these different distributions of the cell assemblies with the, with the accumulation in the central areas. Here again, the network structure, but here at the top, there is a statistic um, of the distribution of the cell assembly neurons across the different areas. And you can see here in the 
in the, in the visual cortex and the motor cortex of the network, there's a clear and highly significant difference between the word categories and also in the pre, in the secondary areas, premotor and and uh, secondary visual areas, there's still a clear difference. Now and and here in the in the in the central areas, prefrontal and temporal pole, uh, we have. This, on the other hand, the highest neuron density is generally, and but still also a significant, uh, but 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 much smaller difference between uh, word categories. So we explain here category specificity of the of the semantic uh, network, and uh, but also the existence of semantic hubs based on connectivity structure of the network. So don't say that any such grounding model would not be able to explain the, the so-called symbolic uh, regions of the brain, the temporal pole. It can very well. And it can, can explain this by um, neurobiological principles. Finally, a further feature um, which sometimes is seen as contrasting with models of the type we have seen. Cell the cell assembly model has sometimes been uh, called a, a rather unflexible network because a network model because uh, it has been claimed that that these mechanisms are kind of graved in stone and and cannot be changed from a, a, a dependent on functionality. But importantly, if deprivation happens and a strong reorganization happens in the brain, the cell assemblies uh, it's it's not so clear how these cell assemblies then would actually move or change or become plastic. And therefore, we focused, Rosaria Tomazello focused in one of the studies on explaining such um, neuroplasticity uh, by looking at language representation in the blind under deprivation. And we know, of course, that the visual cortex comes into play in linguistic tasks in uh, in uh, sometimes in everybody, as we have seen for visually related words. However, generally uh, in language processing, the visual cortex plays a small role. However, in the blind, in the congenitally blind uh, a person, there, there would be a strong uh, contribution of visual cortices to language processing. And this is not well understood. And especially uh, based on a fire together, wire together approach, it may be particularly obscure. And some have been argued, for example, Mrs. Bedney, um, that, uh, that uh, uh, such a neurobiological approach cannot explain this. Now, let, let's, let's take a look. Rosario Tomazello did a modeling study now on mapping words to meaning under visual deprivation. For this, he cut off the visual cortex from, uh, sorry, the input from the visual cortex. So when the model wanted to learn, had to learn uh, object related words, there was just no dog uh, picture in the visual cortex. Uh, but but uh, but uh, but uh, um, the word uh, appeared on its the word form appeared on its own. So obviously there was then no semantic learning. However, uh, one can argue that actually in the visually deprived um, person, we don't. This, this is not a realistic language learning scenario because as uh, Lila Kleitman and others have put out famously, uh, put forward famously, uh, the little child would behave very differently in language learning and in early language uh, um, uh, use. For example, when being asked to look up, the child would not just uh, 
move the eye, but he, uh, he or she would actually uh, use his arms to uh, to explore the space above the head. So there would be instead of just uh, just a visual activity, there would be manual activity. Likewise, when learning what a cat is, uh, the the the, the child may more focus on auditory and and touch inputs and, and actually touch the objects whose name uh, is being learned. So one may argue that we uh, we we end up as a as a blind person we may end up um, making many object related words to act uh, into action words just by moving the hands more. But, but then still, also in action word learning, something is different for the uh, for the blind child, namely that this uh, input to the visual cortex is also absent in the action word learning setting. Uh, normally, we have here variable input in the visual cortex. We do not uh, so because the, the, we do not when we when we learn the meaning of an action related word. We do not close our eyes when the little child uh, is told that this is uh, that you're running so nice while he himself is running or she. Then, um, the, then the child would obviously not close the eyes, but the the input would be very variable, and this is translated into the model in any of the semantic learning models by having just a random activity and very variable activity here to the visual cortex. This visual cortex input is therefore normally for the undeprived child um, very variable, but for the blind child there's just nothing. Um, not while for in the in the in the undeprived network of course everything stays the same as before. So this is now um, the word learning result under visual deprivation. As, as you can see here in the in the plots, there is a, there, there there is something different, and the and the clearest different that emerges from this display here is that in the action related word case, there is activation in the and, and there are neurons. Um, in the motor cortex, uh, sorry, sorry, in the visual cortex. Here is the visual cortex, and uh, and this has a few neurons. So this is strange. This is actually what we what we were hoping for. This is the fact: in the visual cortex, is active in language processing in the uh, in the um, in the blind child or in the in the con genitally blind person. Um, but why is this? Well, what we know is that the, that the visual input has been cut off, but obviously in the case of the action words, there was no visual, visual input uh, in any case. So the, uh, the, this um, change of functionality must relate to the lack of this variable input. And uh, here again the results statistically across a larger group. And as you can see here on the right, there's a difference for the object related words. Also, there's generally stronger networks uh, for the for the um, for, for the undeprived in the undeprived case. But here it really becomes really interesting for the action related words. And as we argue, um, as we can argue that the child that the uh, the, that the blind child treats many words like action words. Uh, this might be of particular significance. And as you can see here in the box, in the in the yellow box, uh, the, in the in the visual cortex, primary visual cortex, there is a lot of activation, uh, a lot of cell assembly contribution for the uh, in the for the deprived population, but not in the healthy uh, network, so to speak. Otherwise, the differences in the perisome cortex, there are no clear differences. Why is this? Well, one approach to 
the, to, to the explanation here comes from an observation Dursa and Bienenstock have been made already 20 years ago. And, and they, say they, they looked at a network in which there was just a little bit of activation in the center and they found that everything else being silent around them and just being contaminated by a little bit of noise, act, uh, the representations um, emerge, emerging from regular activation of just a single neuron, uh, uh, the result is just an increase of the, new, of the neuron population that strongly connects to this single activated neurons, neuron. So there is a, an expansion of the neural representation uh, with, with uh, co correlated activation. And this is exactly what, what also happened in this network. So the, the learned networks were actually, uh, were actually forced in, the, in this part of the network, but then activation spread to the unused part of the network. And for this, it was essential that no activation came in, even though no random activation came in from the visual side. So visual deprivation led to the spreading of activation and the extension of the representation into the visual domain of the network. This is the explanation of the motor engagement of, v of primary visual cortex in many language tasks in the blind. Okay, so we, uh, we, are, we are through with the four questions and their putative answers. Please give me your feedback about uh, what you think about these, exp these tentative explanations. Uh, let, me, let me just um, go back to the list of brain constraints on the model and emphasize that we have now seen in these examples I gave you different features that became relevant in the explanations. The connectivity structure was particularly important in the explanation of the, of the working memory, verbal working memory emergence. Um, then the cortical area structure and differential activation uh, of, the, uh, of these areas was important for the category specificity um, explanation, but also the connectivity structure was relevant here. Think of the uh, question of why semantic hubs emerge in the connector hub areas. The answer is A precisely because they are connector hubs and they are trafficking so much information. And finally, the deprivation issue uh, was uh, emphasizes the, um, the, the relevance of realistic learning, not only by implementing a kind of a Hebbian learning schema, but also by uh, modeling the situations in which, in this case, grounding can take place. Um, Open questions, there are many, and, uh, and we are just uh, at the beginning, at the beginning of a new grant where we are uh, where we are fo focusing on the focal following questions. Uh, we want to uh, move from the small vocabularies of only 20, 40 words, as in the in the previous simulations, to large vocabularies uh, to. 10,000 of words by increasing the model and also increasing the realistic uh, re the realism of the representations by implementing, for example, features of phonological and semantic uh, similarity in the network. Then, of course, you, as we have mentioned and you have noticed several times, the parietal cortex is missing in this model, and this is a drawback. We need to fix that. Uh, we want to include gestures also, especially in the context of pragmatic learning. Uh, we want to have combinations and syntax. This is a long standing effort, and we have done some uh, toy simulations here. However, a realistic uh, large scale simulation is still missing. Um, and then, of course, there are sophisticated semantic uh, questions about semantic feature emergence, 
among uh, about uh, the representation of abstract uh, meaning, internal state meaning, and uh, and finally also uh, learning mechanisms different from just uh, grounding in real object and action um, contexts, but uh, but but rather. Uh, indirect grounding and and the so-called non-associative semantic learning and so on and so forth. These are all open questions, and we are uh, we are approaching uh, there. Um, uh, well, uh, at least to address them. Okay, and now I'm through with the talk. I thank you very much for your attention, uh, but I would also like to thank uh, the, the the various funders who contributed to. Uh, to to the work, uh, here is a is a list starting with a uh, with those in England still, and then also more recently the German funders, and uh, uh, and of course the European ones too, and then most importantly I should thank my collaborators Rosario Tomazello, who did the deprivation and also the semantic model simulation, Malte Schomos Henningsen, uh, who, as I said, uh, was behind the, um, uh, the verbal working memory simulation, Max Garignani, who built the model in the first place and contributed to all of this research, and then, of course, uh, Thomas Wenikus, who wh whose picture I couldn't actually uh, copy here, I'm sorry, um, uh, the, all, without uh, without the contributions of all of the all the four, uh, this work would not have been uh, possible. And now, thank you very much once again for your attention and support. Have a good uh, discussion and a good day then.